Have you ever wondered what's inside of a kangaroo's pouch? Maybe they're saving some snacks for later. Maybe it's for their house keys. Or perhaps they're used to their part-time job transporting people to work every day. The short answer is kangaroos use the pouch to carry their young, or joey. They need the bag because after a short gestation period of up to 36 days, the joey is born and crawls into the pouch for their continued development, where other mammals would not. Once he is born, it's the size of a jelly bean. Although he is deaf and blind, it has an acute sense of smell and finds its way into the warm and protected pouch. The joey will then attach itself to the mother to drink milk where it receives nutrients and from there it will live, grow and develop for the outside world for the next four to six months. Once the joey develops enough, it can leave the pouch and stretch its legs to adapt to the world outside. But it will still go back to feed inside the pouch for a further six to 12 months. These time frames vary depending on the types of species of kangaroos there are four different types. The red kangaroo, the largest of all the kangaroos and all terrestrial animals in Australia, is found throughout the mainland, though generally in deserts and open grasslands. Nicknamed the Big Red, it can stand as tall as six feet and weigh up to 200 pounds. The eastern grey is mainly typical of the eastern coasts. These are the second largest, with a height of 5 feet tall and a weight of up to 180 pounds. The Antilopine kangaroo, the smallest of the four, is located in the far northern tropical regions. Their height reaches up to 4 feet tall and they can weigh as much as 110 pounds. And lastly, you'll find the western grey in the southwestern and southern areas of the continent weighing up to 120 pounds while standing up to 4 feet tall. Of all the different sizes, their most notable ability is to leap forward in a bouncing motion, covering vast distances. The Big Red can cover up to a staggering 30 feet in just one bounce. Although, what makes the kangaroo so unique isn't uncommon in Australia. They share evolutionary traits with other classifications of macropods. Wallabies, wallaroos, quokkas, and patamelons are distant cousins of the kangaroo, with several species in each classification. They all come in many different sizes and live in the unique areas that they've adapted to throughout Australia and New Guinea. Although marsupials were once more common throughout the rest of the world, it's unclear where they originated. The old fossils of marsupials were found in North America, but it is clear that the marsupials slowly made their way down under and came through South America, across Antarctica, until finally into Australia. Of course, we're keeping in mind that this was when the continents were all still attached. Once making it to Australia, they quickly adapted without competition from the other animals. Some other mammals made it to Australia around the same time. The bat family and the rodent family, it's not surprising that mites and rats had managed to make it to Australia before humans. Although Australia's climate would have been very different from what we know of it today, marsupials had adapted quickly to the changes. There has been some debate about the unique characteristics of the marsupial were better suited for the drastic changes in weather as opposed to other animals. The smaller gestation period allows their young to feed on milk a lot sooner. Marsupial milk has growth and immunity factors greater than other mammals' milk, which could be beneficial in a harsher environment, which is why marsupials are more prominent in Australia. The kangaroo has explicitly adapted over the ages. Their success in adaptation reflects on their current population of around 48 million throughout Australia, easily outnumbering the human population. Although their success is not entirely due to their unique traits, it's mainly due to the lack of predators. The dingo. The mammal migrated to Australia approximately 8,000 years ago, but their numbers are controlled around most of Australia. And then there was also the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, which slowly disappeared from the mainland since humans arrived around 50,000 years ago. And it's estimated they disappeared completely around 4,000 years ago, allowing marsupials like the kangaroo to thrive. The fascinating thing about thylacine is that it provides an excellent example of convergent evolution, 
It is the process where animals not closely related independently evolve similar traits. The thylacine and the gray wolf come from entirely different parts of the planet and only share a common ancestor that existed at least 160 million years ago, yet they evolved similarly. Other marsupials fit the category of convergent evolution. The marsupial sugar glider, which is like the placental flying squirrel, the hopping mouse, which is like the North American kangaroo rat. There are types of marsupials and other moles. The Tasmanian devil is like the hyena and wolverine, and the wombat has resemblances to the groundhog and marmot. The possums and their cousin, the opossum in North America, has evolved to have opposable thumbs, a feature found in primates. Hedgehogs and porcupines, mammals completely unrelated to Australia, have their unique spikes but share this similarity with the echidna. The echidna is another mammal altogether and not a marsupial. It is of the monotreme order. The echidna is one of the only two left in the monotreme mammals. Unlike other mammals, monotremes don't produce live young but lay eggs, of which their young, or puggle, hatches just 10 days after being laid. But like all other mammals, the puggle will drink milk from their mother. A further example of convergent evolution is with the koala, which has evolved to have fingerprints like primates. The koala has adapted through the warming of the weather in Australia. As the climate became drier, there was a distinct change in the fauna throughout the continent. Eucalyptus trees became more prominent as they more easily adapted to drier climates. Over 70% of native forestry in Australia is currently eucalyptus. The eucalyptus leaves, or gum leaves, are deficient in nutrition. They are so low in nutritional value that they shouldn't be the main diet. But the koala took advantage of this uncontested food and adapted over time. And now they only eat them, and they'll gorge themselves up to six times per day. It ensures that they need to sleep up to 20 hours each day. But although they sleep a lot, they're very safe high above the eucalyptus trees. The animal world in Australia is strange as it is diverse. But even those natives in this land have their own stories that make them even more bizarre. Indigenous Australians have stories from the dream time, telling tales of weird animals that existed. One mythological animal was the bunyip. It has been told in tales as a beast that lurked within the swamps, rivers, and lakes. Although commonly known as the bunyip, it's also referred by many different names throughout the country. Before Europeans arrived in Australia, there existed around 250 languages within the native population. Each language has a similar story of a beast that lived within the water, which would provide a valuable lesson to young children to be careful around swamps and rivers. The bunyip's various forms, scales, fur, or feathers, sizes as small as a dog and as large as a buffalo. Some are unimaginably strange in appearance, but others weren't too dissimilar to actual animals like the crocodile. A precursor to how mythological creatures like the bunyip were created had likely originated from bones and fossils of existing animals. For example, in Europe, stories about dragons are argued that they probably originated from finding dinosaur fossils. Fossils are the likely foundations for the stories based around the infamous bunyip, animals from the megafauna period, which around 2.5 million years ago saw the largest of them all. This period ended about 20,000 years ago. Variations of the bunyip coincide with animals that once lived during this period. The thylosolio, also known as the marsupial lion, was a large and powerful carnivorous marsupial. The diprotodon, which resembled a giant wombat, weighed around 6,000 pounds and was 10 feet long. A further version was of a beaked bunyip covered in feathers related to the dromornithidae, a bird standing at 10 feet tall. Each of these was from a time when megafauna was more common, and humans lived among them for a short period. Although the age of megafauna in Australia has long passed, there are still animals that adapted to the changes in the drying continent, the new species introduction, and even the involvement of humans. The four kangaroos, the red eastern, the western grey, and the atilopine are still living reminders of the age of megafauna. Why is Australia so strangely empty? Why haven't we discovered so much of the ocean? Is our planet a perfect sphere? 
And was the Earth once more purple than green? I bet you didn't know these facts about our planet. So let's find it all out. Australia is really massive. To make it easy to understand its size, it's nearly as large as the entirety of Europe. Home to around 26 million people, Australia is among the countries with the least population per area. It's ranked only 55th for the highest population in the world, while it has the 6th largest land area. Why is so much of it empty? A good guess would be the many dangerous animals hiding behind every rock. At least this is enough for me to avoid Australia. But there's one specific reason to explain this. The dryness of Australia ensures that 85% of the population lives within 30 miles of the coast, and 80% of them live along the eastern side where rainfall is more common. But although there is an overall lack of rainfall, only 20% of Australia is unlivable desert, and only 40% is considered not habitable by human standards. The water consumption is actually higher than their average rainfall each year. But there is a further ancient water source hidden way below, which can support a much larger population. It's one of the largest underground freshwater resources in the world, the Great Artesian Basin. It covers a staggering 656,000 square miles, which is one-fifth the size of Australia. It holds enough water to cover the Earth under a 1.5 feet deep layer of water. Or, more usefully, it could provide enough water for thirsty Australians over the next 1,500 years. Only 6.5% of Australia has soil suitable for farming, so this doesn't seem like a huge amount. But in case you forgot, Australia is big. And this small percentage is about the size of France. With this massive area available for farming, Australia has more than enough to feed its population with a further 70% of agriculture products that are exported overseas. So, with plenty of land, food, and water, why are the population figures so low? A very slow migration process is the reason. First, only people from the United Kingdom lived there. Then, they opened their borders to other Europeans, and this restriction remained in place until 1973. You would think almost 200 years would be enough time for a lot of people to migrate, but Australia was just so far away. The risk of traveling such a long way and the cost of the journey meant that people from Europe prefer the shorter and cheaper options to migrate elsewhere, like Canada or the USA. For the past 2,000 years, people have understood that Earth is round. But did you know that it's not a perfect sphere? Through the wobbly rotation of Earth, our planet constantly changes its size, very slowly, of course. The North and South Poles are surprisingly flat. Earth is pretty much like a ball being squished. Imagine there's a giant hand with the fingers pressing at both poles. Because of this pressure, the equator pushes a little outwards. Along with an uneven gravitational field, Earth has loads of gravity glitches, some positive and others negative, creating an uneven, rocky and bumpy surface. Some places on Earth have more gravity than others. If you weighed yourself along the equator, you would weigh 0.5% less than at the poles. Not a whole lot and definitely not worth the trip to change your weight. If you were to measure the length from the center of the Earth towards the furthest point of Earth, you would be shocked that Mount Everest isn't at the end of it. Instead, it's along the equator, which is the pushed out part. Ecuador's mountain Chimborazo would actually be the tallest point on Earth, as it's the furthest from the center. We still have around 80% of the ocean to map, which is crazy considering how much of the solar system we've explored in comparison. But we're still aware of many of the unbelievable details about the ocean. It covers over 80% of the world's surface, where 94% of the Earth's wildlife lives. And from some of the life in it, up to 80% of the world's oxygen is produced mainly from plankton, algae, and bacteria. One of the most famous already mapped places is the Mariana Trench. It's the deepest point on Earth, as low as almost 7 miles deep. That's a huge, 5 times the length of the Grand Canyon and deeper than Mount Everest is tall. It's also home to one of the most ancient seabeds on Earth, casually laying low for about 180 million years. 
the pressure at the bottom is over 1,000 bars. But although this is 1,000 times more than normal pressure, life still flourishes here. Throughout the ocean, there is an estimated over 3 million shipwrecks lying in the murky depths. Countless artifacts sit there untouched, and there could be more than all the world's museums. The Mid-Ocean Ridge is the longest in the world, reaching 40,000 miles. That's almost 10 times the size of the Andes, the longest mountain range on land. The sun is the reason behind the blue and aqua colors of the ocean. This color isn't from the reflection of the sky, though they are both blue for the same reason. The surface of our planet receives white light from the sun, and it absorbs the orange, red, and yellow light stronger. It doesn't absorb the blue light so much, so it returns to how we see it. Of course, this only occurs based on how pure the water is. If the water is full of mud or algae, they scatter the light and overpower the water's natural blueness. There are many factors that determine what color we see on our planet. Could you believe that the Earth was green before? Instead, it was purple. Chlorophyll in our atmosphere absorbs mainly blue and red wavelengths from the sun and reflects the green ones to what we see our planet as today. Long ago, ancient microbes called retinol dominated the Earth instead of chlorophyll. They absorbed green light and reflected red and violet light. Those microbes had a simpler structure, so they were easier to produce in the low oxygen environment of the early Earth. They provided our planet with a purplish color instead of green. But chlorophyll is more efficient, and as the Earth was developing, it eventually took over. Imagine that billions of years ago, faraway observers could see our home as a small purple dot. I wonder if we could have also been purple. Probably not. The biggest tree on Earth is a giant sequoia named General Sherman. It stands over 280 feet, almost reaching the height of a 26-story building. They believe it to be 2,700 years old, with a circumference of 1,000 inches. Its weight is a staggering 1,800 tons. That's heavy, but it isn't the heaviest living thing on Earth. In Utah, a huge grove of trees called Pando works like a single colony of trees. The massive root system connects all of them together with up to 47,000 stems. It weighs up to 6,000 tons and is 80,000 years old. It makes it the oldest living thing known to humans. Now, what about the biggest area of one being? Off the coast of Western Australia, a seaweed grows to an unthinkable size. The Poseidon's ribbon weed has been growing for 4,500 years, spreading underground clone shoots. It's all connected and shares the same DNA with most of its shoots. It covers a massive 77 square miles, the same size as 28,000 soccer fields, or the size of Nebraska. And it won't stop there either, as it continues to grow by two feet each year. It's hard to even picture the scale of these enormous beings. Now, just imagine if they were all purple.
Don't even try to escape. Wow. Okay, okay, I got it. Jeez. No need to swing your fists here. These savages can't even eat in peace. Your geography teacher must have told you there are seven continents in the world. In 2017, scientists made an announcement that changed this universal truth. The discovery of Zealandia. They called for a change in world maps and provided us with some proof, of course. First off, let's take a look at the ocean floor near New Zealand. The continental shelves of this mysterious continent are chilling at a depth of around 3,280 feet below sea level. The nearby oceanic crust dives even deeper at 9,800 feet below that. All of that is giving us those continent vibes with varying altitudes from deep below the ocean to the majestic Mount Cook, standing tall at 12,217 feet above sea level. Brave geologists have gone deep down to collect rocks from the ocean floor. They found that unlike the nearby oceanic crust, which is made up of fresh basaltic rocks, the crust around New Zealand is one impressive mix. We're talking granite, limestone, sandstone, and some ancient rock types that are incredibly ancient. All this screams continental crust. Finally, scientists have discovered a narrow strip of oceanic crust that separates Australia from the hidden land of Zealandia. It means these two are separate continents. 85 million years ago, Zealandia decided to break free from the supercontinent Gondwana. Millions of years later, the Earth's tectonic plates, those puzzle pieces that make up our planet's crust, started throwing a wild party. The mighty Pacific Plate, the heavyweight champion of tectonic plates, decided to take a dive beneath Zealandia's continental crust. This process is called subduction. As a result, the root of Zealandia, that connection to its continental crust, broke off and went into the depths below. So you see now that it takes millions of years and a lot of action for a new continent to form. But what if the impossible happened and a new continent formed overnight in the Pacific Ocean? The next morning, you'd probably spill your morning coffee while watching the news. For this newfound land to be considered a full-fledged continent, it needs to have a surface area like Zealandia and be a large, uninterrupted chunk of land with some water surrounding it. And here comes the twist. The Pacific Ocean has an average depth of 13,000 feet. So if a continent wanted to join the party, it would have to push a whole lot of rock upward, shaping its way to the surface. A new continent emerging overnight would make sea levels skyrocket. We'd have to say goodbye to geographically low-lying countries like Bangladesh, Senegal, and the Netherlands. The ocean currents would be in for a wild ride too. The North Pacific subtropical gyre, a vibrant hotspot for marine life, would be thrown off balance. Those poor marine creatures who rely on the currents for their journeys would need some new source of navigation. Plus, the creatures that live permanently in one place could lose their main food source. Oceans are like global free-for-alls, but with a new continent in play, the countries situated nearby would be willing to stake their claim on this unexpected landmass. This new continent would be a blank canvas. No lush landscapes or freshwater sources, just rock and more rock. So if you are dreaming of relocating to this novelty, you have to wait for some serious terraforming to make it habitable. But for now, let's go back to the real new continent of Zealandia. It's actually a microcontinent, which is an official word for a landmass that has separated from a main continent. In our case, it was Antarctica and then Australia. You could say Zealandia is a bit shy, with only up to 7% of its size peaking above the water surface. But it's nearly 70% as large as Australia in total and proudly boasts of two major islands we know and love as New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island. Plus, there are many smaller islets. The largest islands have glaciers, like the famous Tasman Glacier on the South Island, Thanks to some glacial action in the past, Zealandia can show off its fjords and valleys. 
New Caledonia has a tropical vibe with its Oceania and South Pacific connections. The unofficial eighth continent is a hotspot for geological action. Part of it belongs to the Australian plate, while the rest rides the Pacific plate. It has six major areas with active volcanoes. And don't forget the geothermal treats, geysers and hot springs are scattered all over the place, courtesy of the Australian and Pacific plates having a steamy interaction. The underwater world of Zealandia is a treasure chest of mineral deposits and natural gas fields. It's also a scientific playground. During those icy glacial periods, sea levels dropped and more of Zealandia emerged from the depths. The fossils this process left behind are like an encyclopedia of valuable clues about the life that thrived here during ancient times. The search for Zealandia lasted for 375 years. It all started in 1642, when Dutch seafarer and explorer Abel Tasman set on a mission from Jakarta, Indonesia. Back in the day, Europeans were sure that there had to be a massive land down under to balance out their own continent up north. They even had a fancy name for it, Terra Australis. Tasman was determined to become the first to find it. He went west, then south, then east, all the way to the South Island of New Zealand. But here's where things took a turn for the worst. The local Maori people, who had been living there for centuries, didn't exactly roll out the red carpet. They rammed one of Tasman's small boats, and sadly, four of the Europeans met their ends. What happened next remains a mystery. But a few weeks later, Tasman sailed back home without ever stepping foot on this mysterious land he believed to be the great southern continent. He never came back. The explorer didn't even realize that he was actually right all along about the existence of a missing continent. And you already know it only became official in 2017. Another lost and found continent isn't hiding in the ocean, but under Europe. It's called the Greater Adria, and it collided with Europe and started to sink under it around 140 million years ago. Today, it lies beneath Italy, Greece, and the Baltics. Its size and even shape match that of Greenland, the world's largest island. Greater Adria is no longer visible, but it left some clues. Parts of it were embedded in the Alps. Other chucks were incorporated into present-day Italy and Croatia on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. Limestone rocks from the former continent started to change once they were under the European landmass. Tremendous heat and pressure spread over tens of millions of years changed their structure. Out goes the limestone, in comes the marble. All the Greek and Roman temples you admired on your summer vacation were constructed using this marble. It was sort of a going away gift from a long lost continent. You don't notice this, but our planet never stops moving and it happens deep beneath our feet. 120 million years ago, Australia and Antarctica were a single piece of land. They went their separate ways, but Antarctica didn't leave empty-handed. Today, there is an oceanic plateau in the Indian Ocean. Long ago, it was connected to another lost continent, the Kerguelen microcontinent. Scientists believe that it made a land bridge between India and Antarctica. To find out what it was like, we can look at a tiny archipelago in the southern Indian Ocean. These islands are all that is left of the ancient landmass. They have a cold climate and feature glaciers because they're so close to Antarctica. But in the past, the climate must have been temperate with plenty of rainfall. The animals and plants would have been similar to those that we find in tropical regions today. The lost continent landscape was probably much like that of New Zealand. Our planet keeps changing, and at some point, all the continents will reconnect with each other forming one supercontinent again. And maybe then, future humans will wonder, what if our continent broke into pieces tomorrow? The theory of parallel worlds has been discussed in the scientific community for a very long time. Unfortunately, we're not developed enough yet to prove or disprove it. But it's still an interesting theory, and that's why we have a lot of unusual urban legends about the guests from a parallel reality, according to many. Let's check out a few of them. A man from a non-existent country. 
This story took place in 1851 in a small German village, Frankfurt an der Oder. A lost man came out to the local villagers asking for help. The man introduced himself as Jopar Voren. He spoke very poor German and had a very strong accent. The man himself claimed that he speaks Laxar and Abram, languages that don't actually exist on our earth. He claimed to be from Laxaria, a country on the mainland called Sacria, separated from Europe by a huge ocean. However, none of these places existed on the Earth's map. People sent Yopar to the local authorities. He talked to a psychiatrist, but the doctor concluded that the man was totally sane. An investigation by the local police also revealed nothing suspicious about him. Yopar Voren claimed that the purpose of his visit to Europe was to find his long-lost brother. He survived a shipwreck and found himself near the village. They showed him a map of the world and a globe and asked him to indicate the place where he crashed, but he didn't recognize anything familiar. He seemed to have extensive knowledge about his homeworld. Yopar named five main continents on it, Sakria, Aflar, Ostar, Auslar, and Uplar. His story was considered plausible. Scientists from Frankfurt decided to send the man to Berlin for further research. However, during the trip, he had something like a seizure. The man suddenly jumped out of the carriage and disappeared into the surrounding forest. Despite a long and thorough search, no traces of Jopar were found. He seemed to have disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared. Inspector Lebouf, who was assigned to escort him to Berlin, thought this man could be a being from another world and that he had returned from where he had come from. Lady on Highway 167 This incident happened on October 20th, 1969. It was first reported in 1988 in the magazine Strange. The article tells about two men, L.C. and his business partner, Charlie. The names are fictitious. One afternoon, L.C. and Charlie were driving along Highway 167 in southwest Louisiana. Discussing work, they drove toward the oil center of Lafayette. The highway was empty at first, but then the men noticed a very old and very slow car ahead. The men started discussing this mysterious car. Such cars hadn't been produced for several decades, but this one looked quite new. The men thought it was thanks to the owner's care and admired it. They slowed down to get a better look at the car. L.C. noticed a bright orange sign on it that said 1940. They saw a driver. It was a young woman in old-fashioned clothes, a hat with a long feather and a fur coat, even though it was warm outside. There was a child next to her, also dressed in a warm coat and a hat. L.C. and Charlie wanted to talk to her, but then they noticed the expression on her face. The woman was looking around in panic, almost on the verge of crying. L.C. called out to her and asked if she needed help. She nodded, and he gestured for her to park on the side of the road. But when the men also parked, they suddenly noticed that the woman's car had disappeared. They looked around the highway in shock. She couldn't have gone somewhere far so fast, but the car was nowhere to be found. After some time, another man drove up to L.C. and Charlie. He saw everything that happened and claimed that the car had simply disappeared. The men talked about the incident for several hours. When they reached the city, they contacted the police. However, the police couldn't help them in any way. Apart from their words, there was no confirmation of the existence of the car. The case was discussed for a while in local newspapers and then was forgotten. The Gadianton Canyon Incident this incident occurred in May of 1972 in southeastern Utah near the Modena Railroad Crossing on the edge of the Escalante Desert. Jenna North was driving her father's 1971 Chevrolet Nova. Her friend, Carol Abbott, was in the passenger seat. In the back seat, there were two other girls, Lisa Rockford and Bethany Gordon. It was after 10 p.m. when the girls crossed the Utah-Nevada state line. They wanted to get back to campus before their housekeeper, Mrs. Mortensen, locked the dorm doors. This stretch of Highway 56 in Utah is pretty deserted. There's nothing there but sand and a few plants. 
The girls were very happy when they finally noticed the Union Pacific Railroad crossing in Modena. But right behind the railing, Jenna noticed two highways. One went into the desert, and the other to Gadianton Canyon. The girls decided to take the road to the canyon. They thought it would be a shortcut to campus. The other girls were chatting with each other when Jenna noticed that they were no longer driving on asphalt, but on white cement. Watch out, suddenly shouted one of the girls. The road ended abruptly at a high rock wall. It was a dead end. They had to go back the same way they came here. And while Jenna's friends were complaining that now they would have to sleep in the car, Jenna saw that the landscape had changed dramatically. They weren't in the desert anymore. Instead, the canyon turned into an open area with wheat fields, pine thickets, and a small lake ahead. A full moon was shining in the sky, which was strange because it shouldn't have been there that night. The girls had no idea where they were, so they just drove to the light ahead. It was some building that they thought was a diner or restaurant. The girls saw a bright neon sign, but none of them could read what was written on it. These symbols were unlike any language they knew. Suddenly, several people came out of the building. They seemed shocked and frightened by Jenna's Chevrolet. They waved their hands and shouted something, but the girls didn't understand them. Lisa decided to ask the men for directions. She stuck her head out of the window and immediately let out a terrifying scream. Get out of here, she shouted to Jenna. The Chevrolet sped away from the building. Bright headlights illuminated their car from behind. They were being chased by a few vehicles. These vehicles were egg-shaped, had three wheels, and made a buzzing sound. The road ahead led back to the canyon. Jenna didn't have time to slow down and crashed right into it. The vehicles had disappeared together with an unfamiliar landscape. The girls were back in the desert again. Fortunately, none of them were hurt, physically. But Lisa was in a state of shock. She was saying again and again, they weren't human. The girls had to help her walk. An hour later, they were able to stop a Utah Highway Patrol car. They told the police their story. The details of the report compiled by the police officer were complicated and confusing. During the investigation, the police couldn't figure out from the tire tracks exactly where the car went astray. The tracks ended very abruptly, as if the Chevrolet had suddenly disappeared. The police couldn't explain how the car could have driven two miles without leaving any traces, especially on such solid ground. There are still disputes about this story, but in the end, all versions and explanations of what happened are just guesses. Perhaps we'll never find out the truth. These were the urban legends about interdimensional traveling. Of course, there's no proof that any of these stories are real. Often the truth turns out to be very mundane. For example, the famous man from Taurid, who people also called a guest from another reality, turned out to be a simple fraudster named John Allen Kuchar Zegrus. But even so, these stories are still very interesting. Scientists claim that Icelandia was a region between Greenland and Scandinavia that was more than 230,000 square miles but is now underwater. The Earth was once a large pizza pie with all the continents connected to each other millions of years ago, otherwise known as Pangaea. The North Atlantic region we know today was dry land from about 335 million to 175 million years ago. For many years, scientists and geologists assumed that the North Atlantic Ocean was birthed as Pangaea began to split apart roughly 200 million years ago. With volcanoes in the region where Iceland is, the country came to be just 60 million years ago as it broke off and sailed away from all the other lands. And since the Earth was like a large pizza pie, it divided like one. Many of the lands split up into many large and small pieces, creating the continents we know today. But this new theory suggests that the result of Pangaea's splitting left out some land that stretched for around 200 miles. And just about 10 million years ago, that piece of land submerged in the waters on the eastern and western side leaving the tip of the land, which is now Iceland. When plate tectonics move, they grind on each other, which gave shape to our current landscape, all thanks to the mantle. 
this new radical theory goes against everything written in history books and what scientists have been studying. They began shaking heads, drawing lots of skepticism and criticism. But by analyzing the ocean floor under Iceland and the Earth's crust, we can assume that this idea isn't far-fetched. The crust beneath Iceland happens to be a lot thicker than the typical ones. Oceanic crust is made up of unique melted rocks compared to the land crusts where we walk and live on, and is a lot more denser. The thinnest layer on Earth is the crust, where life takes place. It's essential for water, growing food, gathering natural resources and minerals, and breathing in oxygen. It sinks below to the bottom, but right above the Earth's mantle. It also refreshes itself, since it constantly gets recycled into the mantle and back up. This is why the rocks in the oceanic crust are around 25 miles thick, compared to just 5 miles anywhere else. This is also reasonable given that it's in a hot spot for volcanoes. Magnetic surveys of the ocean floor show layers of molten crust in stripe patterns. Also given the fact that the Earth's magnetic field changed its polarity over millions of years, it played a role in shaping the foundation of our landscape. But there isn't any hmm. concrete evidence to prove this new theory just yet. One of the first steps is to start digging the ocean floor near Iceland. Zircon is a very sturdy mineral that can last for billions of years despite erosion in the Earth's crust. By taking samples and studying them, researchers can estimate the geological age of the continents. This will make sure the crust is oceanic, which is thicker, or continental, which is the regular crust we walk on. This isn't an overnight project and would come with a hefty cost. Another way is to do seismic surveys that can measure echoes conducted on research ships. Drilling holes miles deep in the crust can also help with the research. But this would cost more than studying the zircon minerals. Some fossilized plants unique to both Scandinavia and Greenland might prove that Icelandia was once on the surface and possibly scattered with trees. It wasn't a cold land as it is today, so it may have had forests. But scientists still haven't found fossil evidence of animals common in both lands to suggest anything. But maybe time will tell. The theory goes deeper, which suggests that there was a greater Icelandia. With Iceland, Ireland, Britain, Scandinavia, and Greenland all in one microcontinent, it could be a destination of winter enthusiasts and great for skiing. It could be possible to connect Canada to Greater Icelandia by train over the ocean, which would open up the economy even more. Iceland is around 40,000 square miles, which is already quite big. And if the Greater Icelandia was present today, then Europe would be a completely different continent. Many theories are circulating about other possible hidden microcontinents around the world. Scientists aren't certain of the possibility of Icelandia's existence, but if all the studies conducted were done correctly, then the theory could change everything we know about Iceland and the North Atlantic Ocean. And this could pave the way for other sunken microcontinents around the world. Another theory out there is that New Zealand was the tip of a lost subcontinent, even bigger than Icelandia, called Zealandia. Studies show that it separated from the supercontinent Gondwana between 79 to 83 million years ago. Scientists claim that it's the thinnest and youngest continent discovered underwater. Creighton is a core rock that acts as the main foundation for most continents. It's at least a billion years old, but the continental crust that makes up Zealandia is just half of that, which makes it quite young. That means some Creighton is missing even though it holds some leftovers of older rocks and parts of the mantle. They're estimated to be as old as 2.7 billion years old. Scientists did some studies on the zircon crystals from New Zealand and found out that they're as old as 1.3 billion years old. The rest of the continents are more than 3 billion years old. Scientists studied the composition of the rocks in the bottom of the ocean around New Zealand. They're made up of silica and granite, which are found in continental crusts. The ocean floors mainly have magnesium and iron-rich rocks. 
They're also thicker and higher than regular ocean crusts around it. They conducted some studies and collected magnetic and topographic data to see the link between the Tasman and Coral Seas in the Cato Trough region. This is the narrow strip between Zealandia and Australia. Satellite data tracked tiny faults in the Earth's gravity to map out the crust of the ocean floor surrounding the area. They saw the mass that makes up Zealandia quite visible and almost the size of Australia. Even though the signs are there, this doesn't prove anything. It's possible that there are a bunch of microcontinents which all split apart when Australia broke free of Gondwana. Back then, the supercontinent was made up of South America, Antarctica, Australia, Zealandia, Arabia, and the Indian subcontinent. New Zealand is already not the biggest country out there. But if the theories are correct, then Zealandia will be six times its original size. Mauritius is a young island that's only a few million years old. Just 1,200 miles off the coast of Africa, it's believed that the tiny island came to life around 9 million years ago. The underwater volcanoes in the region spewed out so much lava that it formed the land today. But scientists found zircon rocks that are more than 3 billion years old. It may also be part of a continent submerged underwater called Mauritia which is just a quarter of the size of Madagascar. The zircons they found were embedded in solid rocks and not just in the sand, which may rule out that they just washed up on shore from another continent. Some scientists are still not convinced. They suggest that discovering rocks that stand out from the other typical ones brought by an eruption could skew the scientific community to this theory. But just like how Icelandia could be part of Greater Icelandia, Mauritia was once called Rodinia, which consisted of India and Madagascar. Theories suggest that Mauritia was covered in water when India broke away from Madagascar, something like 85 million years ago.